Well, let's start with a little bit of the history of the city where this church that Paul is writing to was founded. Philippi is an actual place. And by the way, I think that this this bears going over whether or not you're into history. I personally happen to love history. Not everybody does. But I think it's worth pointing out and going over, especially in the kind of day that we live in where faith in the validity of the Bible is declining in some places and in some people's minds. And so to remind ourselves that this is an actual letter and that the events that surround it were actual historical events in actual historical places with real people. It's not just a fairy tale or a spiritual book, but this is Paul the Apostle writing to a people in a real place that you can still go visit today. In fact, I've been there. It's, it's quite remarkable uh, to see the jail cell where Paul spent time in Philippi. But it's good to remind ourselves that these events are actually a part of provable history. And so the city itself, the city of Philippi, an actual place, was originally named after Alexander the Great's father, who originally conquered or captured the city from the Thracians back in 360 BC. And then uh, closer to the time of Paul, there was a battle where Octavian, who later became the emperor of Rome, known as Augustus, and Mark Anthony defeated Brutus and Cassius. If you know much about the Roman history, you'll recognize those names. But after that decisive victory, uh, the city was once again renamed Philippi, and it was given the honor of becoming a full-blown colony, which back in those times was a big deal. It was given all of the status and privileges as if it was on Italian soil. It would be seen as, if you would, a miniature Rome in and of itself. And so Philippi was a really important place. And by the, by the time that Paul is traveling there, uh, when he arrives, he would have found Philippi to be a very, in terms of the Roman Empire, it was a very patriotic place. It, it had a famous past. It had a, a, a proud and privileged history and even present reputation. It was a place where uh, senators and soldiers would go to retire if they were in this region because it was such a, an important place. And so th this is what Paul would have run into when he came to Philippi. This was the environment. Why is that important? Well, if you know much of the unfolding of the New Testament in Paul's letters, the church at Philippi was somewhat unique in that it was one of the first and foremost, almost exclusively and entirely Gentile churches. Which if you know about the dynamics of the New Testament and what Paul was after, that's really important because a lot of the churches initially uh, were sort of Jewish in flavor, though they were truly Christian. And yet Philippi was a little bit different because it was right in the heart of sort of Roman patriotism. In, in fact, if you know uh, or have read the story of Paul's journey to Philippi on his second missionary journey, uh, there's an interesting detail about how the church gets started and who Paul initially runs into because there were some women out by the river and Paul had gone there because he had heard that there was a place of prayer, which leads historians and scholars to believe that there wasn't even enough Jewish people in Philippi to form a synagogue. You had, to, you had to have a, a, a specific number of Jewish people in order to actually form a synagogue. And it wasn't that big. It was something like 12 or something, 12 Jewish families. It might have even been a few fewer. But there's such a small Jewish presence, there's no synagogue. They're going to pray out by the river. Paul goes to find where these people are praying, and he runs into these women. And that's how the church has its beginning. As I said, it was on Paul's second 
missionary journey. If you're interested in dates or want to locate it, something somewhere probably around the year 51 AD when Paul arrives in Philippi. You can read about those events in Acts 16. You might want to make a note of that and read that sometime this week. But here's something else interesting about sort of the context when this church gets started and where it has its origin, because if you think about Paul's second missionary journey, his first one was incredible. It starts in Roman, or excuse me, Acts 13, when the church is gathered to worship, and it says that the Spirit of God, when they were worshiping and seeking God and praying, said, set aside for me Barnabas and Paul, and so they're sent out on this first missionary journey to found all of these churches. So there was unity in the church. There was the clear guiding from God and through his spirit to go on the mission. But the second missionary journey didn't have those same features. In fact, it starts off in a very unpromising way. The second missionary journey of Paul starts with the separation of a very close friendship. Remember in Acts 15 when Paul and Barnabas, who were on that first journey and who God had forged together in very significant ways, they have what the New Testament calls a sharp disagreement. And they can't come together and so they separate. In my mind, it's one of the most heartbreaking passages in the book of Acts. But this is how the second missionary journey starts with that separation and with a recommendation that sounds rather reserved as it says that the brothers simply commended Paul and Silas this time to the grace of God. It's almost like when you read it, there's this, this disagreement, there's this dislocation, there's this fracturing, and it's like the brothers, rather than the unity that they saw in the first missionary journey, just said, well, Paul... Good luck. Go with the grace of God. And it's kind of sad. And that, that scenario just turns into more frustration, it seems like, because if you read about how that missionary journey continues, Paul tries to go into Asia to speak the word, but it says that the Holy Spirit prevents Paul from going to Asia. So he turns then to go into Bithynia and it says again that the Holy Spirit restrains or prevents Paul from going into Bithynia. And so we picture Paul, before he comes to Philippi, I do anyways, discouraged and frustrated. Nothing's really going according to plan. Nothing's really even going seemingly all that well. It's a very unpromising start, and it seems to almost entirely run out of steam until Paul gets this vision that we call or that's known as the Macedonian call, where Paul has a vision of a man that comes to him in his dream and says, come over here and help us. And so Paul heads with his companions to this region, to the city of Philippi, and the church begins in the most unlikely way. <laughs> There's a, a woman who's not even really Jewish named Lydia, but she's at the <laughs> prayer meeting. There's a demon-possessed slave girl that's a fortune teller. And then after things go bad and Paul and Silas are thrown in prison and beaten up, but they go free, the jailer gets saved. So I don't know if you've ever been a part of a church plant or, you know, maybe you think your home group's weird, but that's where Philippi started. That was the home group, okay? Gentile woman, demon-possessed slave girl, and jailer. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> that's how the church gets its beginning. And there's an interesting little note for those of you that uh, are interested in these things. I find it really interesting. Some of you know there's this feature in the book of Acts where it, in telling and recounting the, the travels and the journeys of Paul in his missionary endeavors, there's the we language. We went here and we got on a boat and we went there. But right around the time when Paul goes 
to Philippi for the first time, plants this church, the we language ends and it doesn't pick up again until Acts 21 when Paul goes back through Philippi. Now what's interesting about that, I think, is that that leads most people to conclude that Luke was the original guy left behind to look after this brand new church or home group in Philippi. You know, Luke, the guy that wrote the Gospel of Luke. Luke, by the way, the guy that wrote the book of Acts. So it's just an interesting little detail that Luke may very well have been, and it seems that he was the first pastor of the church at Philippi, having been on the missionary journey with Paul, staying there in Philippi when Paul moved on, being there when Paul came back, and then traveling on from that point back to Jerusalem. Well, let's get to the letter itself then. This letter that we're looking at over the next six weeks was written about 10 years after the church itself was planted, so probably somewhere around 61 AD. And at this point, Paul is in a prison, most likely in Rome, and he's writing to this church. And it's interesting because in chapter 4 of Philippians, verse 10, it, it seems, Paul seems to indicate that he thinks that maybe the Philippians forgot about him. But listen to what he says. I'll just read it to you. It might be on the screen too, but Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me but you had no opportunity. What Paul's saying there is that he had begun to think that the Philippians had forgotten him. But what happened, and we know from the letter, is that the Philippians hadn't forgotten Paul. They just hadn't had the opportunity to reach him. But when he was in prison in Rome in one place and the word had gotten to them, they sent a man by the name of Epaphroditus, who shows up again in the letter, and they send with Epaphroditus this financial gift for Paul, which you can imagine must have just blessed Paul that not only was he not forgotten, but, but they express their love for him and the gift that they send. And Epaphroditus, for his part, he almost dies along the journey, probably getting sick. He nearly loses his life. But when he recovers, Paul sends this letter that we're going to be reading and that we're looking at back to the church from prison, essentially to thank them for the gift that they had sent. The structure of the letter itself is, is interesting because it doesn't develop one single idea from start to finish like a lot of Paul's other letters, but Philippians is unique. Philippians is more like a, a collection of short essays that all kind of emanate from this centerpiece that most people would say from the original language is a poem. In the middle of Philippians chapter 2, right in the middle of the book is this, what they call the Jesus poem. Some of you uh, will find it familiar, the words of Paul when he says, um, have this mind, Philippians 2 verse 5, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of the servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Familiar words to some of you? That's the Jesus poem. And all of the other little parts of the book sort of branch out with a word or with a theme from that centerpiece that kind of expand on this idea, and this seems to be the real heart of the book of Philippians, that we would live our lives according to the pattern of Jesus. That's kind of the simple, straightforward message of Philippians. That our lives would become a part, that people could look at our lives 
And our lives, in a sense, would tell the story of Jesus. That those same attributes, that that same mindset, that that same character, that same spirit would be in us. That's Paul's concern, and that's his heart in writing to the Philippians. If you want to look further in how the book kind of lays out um, in your little blue book, uh, you can check out the outline. I'm not going to belabor that anymore because it's right there for you to read. But what I want to do in the time that we have left is just pick up three very simple themes that run through the whole letter that seem really key and important and try and apply them to our lives today because that's the same calling for you and for me. That our lives would follow or form to the pattern of Jesus Christ. That people would be able to look at any area of our lives and see those characteristics, that spirit in us. That the story of Jesus would be told continually through the way that we live. There's this phrase that I heard the last week that I love and I want to share it with you as sort of the overarching theme for these three things and that is this, that our life together as the church is our message. Our life together is our message. We have a message. We proclaim Christ. But our life together is as much a part of that message as the words that we speak. You know this. We know this. That the single greatest thing that stands in the way of the effectiveness of our message as Christians is lives that don't line up with the pattern of the Christ that we proclaim. That is that we would talk about Jesus and how wonderful, for instance, his forgiveness is. And yet not have lives that are characterized by the extension of that same forgiveness to those who sin against us, for example. See, the message of Christ and the story of what Jesus accomplished is in some ways emptied of its power when it's spoken by a church and a people whose lives don't conform to the pattern. That's Paul's interest in writing to the Philippians. So what does he see in the Philippians? And and what are these characteristics that ought to mark us too? Number one, if you're taking notes, incredible generosity. Incredible generosity. If you want to summarize it like this, you can. Philippians, on the surface and in the most straightforward way, is really just a thank you note. (laughs) I remember growing up and after every Christmas and every birthday, my mom would make me write thank you notes. I have a stack of them and all the names and what the people got me and I had to sit there. It seemed like it took forever, but it's what my mom made me do, write thank you notes. It's a good practice to have. Apparently, Paul was in that practice because That's really how Philippians comes about. This church shares a gift with him, an incredibly generous financial gift, and so Paul, inspired by their generosity and the fact that they haven't forgotten him, writes a thank you note. And I guess that sounds so simple, church, but I want to encourage you, not only in generosity, but I want to encourage you in the way that God can use the simplest of things. Think about it. We're here this morning reading a thank you note from about 2,000 years ago. That's how God used this letter from Paul, not only in the lives of the original people who were intended to receive it, but is able to use it in our lives too. And probably all of us could tell the story of at some time receiving a note or an acknowledgement, or a thank you for something we did that really meant a lot to us, that God just used it at the right time in the right way. It's what we needed to hear. And I say that to encourage us. I want to encourage myself too, and I want to encourage you that sometimes 
I think God gives us these little promptings throughout our week and throughout our day where he'll bring someone to mind out of the blue. You're not thinking of them. He'll bring someone or something to mind. Can I encourage you to pay attention to those little promptings as if they were from the very spirit of God? to take the time to write a note, to make a call, to respond to those little leadings. You never know how God might use it in a person's lives, but the book of Philippians is proof that God indeed does in very powerful ways. But really the point behind pointing that out is that all of this comes about as the result of a church that's characterized by this sort of incredible generosity. There really weren't many other churches that supported Paul. Paul's ministry was characterized by the fact that he would work to support himself. And some of that was by Paul's own choosing, but the Philippians were so overflowing in their generosity and love towards Paul that they didn't care about the fact that Paul didn't usually receive gifts. They heard about his need. They heard about his situation and they give this gift anyways. And I'll leave this point, but what I wanna just say to you as a church is that I feel so blessed and so thankful from the position that I sit in that you are characterized by a very real generosity. And I love that about you, Calvary Chapel Petaluma. And I want to encourage you to continue in that and maybe grow and abound more and more in that, in your generosity. Let God continue to use you in that way. I don't know if you'll remember, I don't, I don't expect you to remember everything I say all the time, just most of the time. <clears throat> but in 2 Corinthians 9, and I'll actually put it up on the screen for you, some of you will remember at the beginning of this year, I, I felt like this was a word from God for us for this year, and we're only in April. Have you forgotten? It's easy to forget. But here's, here's what it says. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. I believe that this was a year that began with God making a promise to us that he would enrich us in every way in order that we might be more and more generous as his people. So let's purpose with God's help and by his grace to be marked and to be characterized by this kind of generosity. What kinds of things might God call you to do in terms of generosity? What Ways might he be calling you to give generously to the needs that are around you and that you see? I think this was something really important that characterized the Philippian church, this incredible generosity. But there was also, secondly, an unbreakable unity. So on the surface, Philippians is just a thank you note. We could say a glorified thank you note. But there was another reason why Paul writes, and it's at the end of the letter in chapter four, because apparently there were two women in the church who weren't getting along. I know, it's crazy, huh? <laughs> it's unheard of, even in the early church. <laughs> and we know that there were two women that weren't getting along because we have their names. Paul actually writes their names in the letter and you can sort of imagine the moment when the letter from Paul arrives, you know? <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> Epaphrodites comes back from Rome with word from Paul and they're like, oh man, read the letter. We're all here. It's Sunday. We're gathered. Read it. And, and can you imagine when your Yodia and Sintache, when your names come up in the letter and it's not a good thing? So... I've decided that next Sunday we're going to start <laughs> putting the names of people in the church that can't get along on the screen each week and reading them out loud. What do you guys think? Yeah, <laughs> this guy's excited. <laughs> Can there really be any doubt 
that disunity is the primary weapon our enemy uses to destroy the effectiveness of the church. Our life together is our message. Our message really has no power when our life together is marked by petty differences, grudges and resentments, and unresolved issues. It's interesting because two times in this short letter, Paul calls for unity. Once he calls generally for unity in Philippians 2, verse 2. Look at it with me. He says to these believers, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. That's a clear call in general terms to the church to be together in unity. Again, Paul calls for unity, but this time more specifically and more personally in verse 2 of chapter 4, when he says, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Sintache to agree in the Lord. There should be agreement, there should be unity. And Paul, Paul gives the reasons behind why he's calling for this unity. He reminds them in verse 1 of chapter 2 that they are in Christ, that the Father's love has been poured out and by the Spirit they've been given the gift of this fellowship. And so to, to live in disunity, and I want you to hear me, this is intense, but this is clearly the teaching of the New Testament. To live in disunity is to sin against God. To be given the love of the Father in the fellowship of his Spirit and to be called together in Christ to live in disunity is to sin against God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit who live in perfect unity. So they're in Christ. Paul reminds them this. But they're also, he reminds them before the call to unity in chapter 4 that they are brothers and they're beloved. Paul is using family language. He wants them to remember you belong to the same family. You're joined by the strongest of loves. Why would you tear down your own family? <laughs> that makes no sense. But there's a third thing that Paul reminds them in terms of the importance of their unity, and that is that the opposition that they're facing is real. Look with me at uh, chapter 1 and verse 28. I've just shown you that the call for this unity is in the first verse of chapter two. But look at what comes right before that. Paul says, don't be frightened in anything by your opponents. For this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Paul wants the church to walk in unity because he knows the opposition that they face. And it's amazing because you can see the same train of thought in Paul's call for unity in chapter four. Look at what just precedes it in chapter three, verse 18. Look with me. Paul says, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And notice this, they're not enemies of the cross of Christ because their doctrine is off. Why are they enemies of the cross of Christ? Because of the way that they're living. Their end, verse 19, is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with their minds set on earthly things. One thing you can never accuse Paul of is pulling punches. <laughs> he just calls it like it is. So there's this opposition. The persecution that they faced. 
the opposition from within of people who are living in a way that's contrary to what they say they believe. And so in chapter four, verse one, look at what Paul says. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. That phrase, stand firm, is again a call to unity. How do I know that? because it echoes from chapter one, verse 27, where Paul says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and may hear that you are standing firm in what? One spirit. Stand firm. Stand firm in one spirit because you're in Christ You belong to the same family, and the opposition is real. See, the threat can be seen, but the resources that the church has to meet the threat can also be seen. What is the resource that the church, threatened by persecution and opposition, has? What resource do we have? Our unity. The fact that we can lean on, depend on, and link arms to stand together with our brothers and sisters in Christ is meant to be a tremendous encouragement in the face of opposition. And I want you to see how these two tie together, these two ideas, the characteristics of the Philippian church, incredible generosity, and unbreakable unity, they, they have a tie and a strong link because I think that when you're really invested in the mission, so to speak, when you're really invested in the work of God, you have a strong motivation to work out your differences. If you're not invested, it's easy to walk away, isn't it? at the first sign of disappointment, at the first sign of frustration, at the first moment that things don't go your way, you don't get your way, your preferences aren't being acknowledged, it's easy to walk away when you're not invested. I think this is one of the great dangers that we live in at this particular time and place in in the church because people talk a lot about the reality of how consumer-driven church has become where we think more in terms of our life together and our participation in church in terms of what things are there for us to consume, what products and services are here that meet my needs, rather than what what has God called me to contribute here? Because he's called my life to fit into the pattern of Jesus who took on the form of a servant, He wants me to have this mindset, to not think of myself more highly than others, but to consider others above even my own needs. And what I'm saying to you, church, is the more and more that we invest ourselves through this incredible generosity that God has called us to, the more we invest ourselves in the life of the mission of God through his church, And through God's work, the more motivated we will be to work out our differences. Because we have so much invested. So I encourage you. Invest in God's work. Be a part of what God's doing. Spur one another on to love and good work so that you don't find yourself just drifting aimlessly as a Christian consumer looking for the best products and services at the cheapest price. That's not the pattern or the heart that God has called us to have. Well, our time is gone, so I'll give you my last point, but I won't say a whole lot about it. Unshakable loyalty. I think that's something else that characterized the Philippian church. Unshakable loyalty, incredible generosity, 
unbreakable unity and unshakable loyalty. Jesus at the center of everything. That's ultimately what motivated them to give. That's ultimately what motivated them and bound them together in love was the very life of Jesus in them. And I guess when you consider the Philippians living in this hotbed of Roman patriotism, but you see how Paul calls them to a transferred sense of loyalty. It's an encouragement for you and for me. Where are our loyalties? Paul reminds the Philippians that they are called in verse 20 of chapter 3 to be citizens of God's kingdom. He says, our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. God wants us in an age of of a thousand rivals to be loyal to him in our hearts. That wherever the the fads or the pressures of our day, wherever the culture seeks to conform us into its image, God wants there to be a loyalty in the heart of his people (laughs) that compels us to live in rebellion to that. I love this quote, I'll, I'll close with this, but one commentator put it this way, he said, Philippians was written right under Nero's nose to the elite center of his treasured colonies, challenging Rome and its values, implying its eventual transformation as the gospel radiates through it. That's how we're called to live. The pattern, the story of Jesus lived out in us as his people, the gospel and the power of it radiating in and through our lives with a loyalty to Jesus Christ above everything else. Let's pray.